Okay, let's talk more about the urbanization and corruption of the Industrial Revolution. So, after the war against Southern agrarianism, the Northern cities, which had once virtually locked their doors against freed slaves or, or poor whites, threw open their doors to anyone willing to work long hours for very low wages. In the same northern cities and states, where blacks had once been thrown into trains and wagons and driven south to advance the purposes of radical abolitionists, freed blacks and poor, disenfranchised whites were now welcomed back by the millions. The cities themselves and the industrialists who built them needed two things in order to survive. They needed consumers and they needed low skilled and low paid workers. The grid was beginning to take shape and you could just get a glimpse of its outline if you looked closely at the tenements and apartments growing up towards the sky in the ghettos and slums of American cities. Or the telegraph poles running alongside the railroad tracks that streamed the commercial goods and products out of the city and into the rest of the world. In order for the mind to be satisfied in dehumanizing labor, it must first be fragmented and colonized. It must be broken. Workers were given very menial, repetitive tasks, and they were told that there were a thousand people lining up to take their jobs from them. The carrot and the stick were ever present. There were always billboards and stores that displayed wondrous new products that you might be able to afford someday if only you could manage to work harder and move up in the world. And at the same time, there was always a threat that if you slowed down for just even a minute to survey whether you were making any progress, you would lose everything. Upton Sinclair exposed the inhumanity of this industrial reality in his book, The Jungle, which displayed the horrible reality of life in the industrial packing houses of Chicago. He said, here is a population low class and mostly foreign, hanging always on the verge of starvation and dependent for its opportunities of life upon the whim of men, every bit as brutal and unscrupulous as the old time slave drivers. Under such circumstances, immorality is exactly as inevitable and as prevalent as it is under the system of chattel slavery. He goes on by saying, to be tracked by bloodhounds and torn to pieces is most certainly a merciful fate compared to that which falls to thousands every year in packing town. To be hunted for life by bitter poverty, to be ill-clothed and badly housed, to be weakened by starvation, cold and exposure, to be laid low by sickness and accident, and then to lie and watch while the gaunt wolf of hunger creeps in upon you, upon you and gnaws out the heart of you and tears up the bodies and souls of your wife and babies. Of course, the response to the horrible working conditions of the 19th and early 20th century was not as we might have hoped, a widespread return to the land. Instead, new power centers, statists in the trade unions, and others who claimed to stand for the worker and political power blocks rose up. And along with power, as we can expect, came corruption. If you'll remember, when America was still agrarian, wages were very high because every worker could afford to walk off his job and go start his own farm. But now, especially with ad valorem property taxes, the land was being bought up by speculators, by the railroads, and by commercial farming interests. So land prices were very high. Not to mention that these urban workers had already abandoned that old life, putting all their eggs in one industrial basket. There was no home to which they could return. Most of the things being produced by the new industrial society were things that only 30 years earlier, nobody knew they needed. But the new world system would absolutely require that these unknown needs be made known. And not just these, but million more needs would be created. This manufacture of needs 
would multiply rapidly with the advent of electrification and the arrival of the oil-based economy. In 1752, no one could have imagined the need for a cable that would bring electrical current into every house, farm, or business in America. That spring, when Benjamin Franklin supposedly tied a key to the kite string and sent it up into a stormy Pennsylvania sky, he could not have imagined what would come down the line along with the electricity. Safe, cheap, and readily available electricity would be the springboard of the manufacture of needs. And it started so simply. Okay, next we'll talk about the nightmare of the selling of the American dream. That's it for now. If you like this video, hit the like button, leave a comment and subscribe. And remember, a simple life is a beautiful life.